ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by, and welcome to the LexisNexis Risk Solutions Threat to Global Security webinar series, The Role of Cryptocurrency and Cybercrime. Here are a few brief announcements. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you have a question during the presentation, just use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. For the optimal viewing experience, please log off your VPN and access this webcast using Chrome. Just a reminder, the conference is being recorded. If you're having any issues with the presentation or media player, please press F5 on your PC to refresh your screen. Today's presenters are Douglas Wolfson and Mikong Patnaik. Douglas Wolfson is the Director of Financial Crime Compliance for LexisNexis Risk Solutions in Asia. Headquartered in Hong Kong, he drives strategy and product development of the risk tools used by the biggest banks in the world that help to mitigate financial crime compliance issues. Doug has been in financial services, risk management, and international business for 20 years. This includes leading risk management departments at the world's most recognizable financial institutions. Migrant Patnaik is the co-founder and CEO of Merkel Science. Merkel detects, investigates, and prevents money laundering, terrorist financing, and other criminal activities for crypto asset service providers, financial institutions, and government agencies. McGronk's expertise is in investment banking and technology and spans cryptocurrency and finance across three continents. He's worked at the Bank of America and Luno in Singapore, which was a NASPERS-backed cryptocurrency exchange headquartered in London. Welcome to McGonk and to Doug. And now it's all yours, Doug. Thank you very much, Mary. Always, uh, always appreciate uh, your help on these uh, webinars. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, welcome to uh, Marie Gonk as, uh, as well. Thank you very much for joining me. A reminder for everybody uh, joining us today that, of course, nothing we're telling you is legal advice. If you, if you do need legal advice, please speak directly to your attorneys. Today, we're going to talk a bit uh, about uh, cybercrime. We've discussed in the last two webinars uh, wildlife trafficking, human trafficking. We're going to move into uh, the cyberspace, into the digital space today, and talk about cybercrimes and cryptocurrencies because the two are very often linked. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to, if you're committing cybercrimes, to get paid in any way other than cryptocurrencies, and so it's sort of become the default medium of, uh, of receiving the proceeds of, of cybercrimes. Of course, you know, when you talk about um, uh, you know, uh, hacking banks and things like that, yes, there is the possibility uh, of moving cash, but when you move into crypto, crypto exchange uh, hacking and, um, and ransomware and, and malware like that, then it all becomes focused around uh, cryptocurrency. We're going to talk about how the criminals obtain cryptocurrencies and, uh, and how they launder them. And then in, in terms of what's being done to stop this, uh, we're going to discuss a bit the, the public and private partnerships, what companies and governments are doing together, and then the regulatory aspects and FATF and, and the views on, on FATF and, uh, you know, the, the new regulations, uh, sorry, recommendations uh, 15 and, and 16 interpretive notes. And now that those notes have been released almost uh, about a year ago, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the changes that are taking place uh, in, in the space because of those recommendations and those interpretive notes. And then finally, we're going to talk about some tools and technology and a bit about what are we doing, what is our part in trying to uh, stop cyber crimes and, and cryptocurrency theft. But before we get into all of these subjects, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Marie Gonk. Um, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience, and uh, you know the, the time you spent in the crypto space? Yeah. So, uh, hi, Douglas. So, thanks everybody for attending uh, the webinar. I'm Rigank, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Merkle Science. So, uh, uh, I think uh, Mary was pretty good with the introduction of mentioning what we do. We help detect crypto crime, cryptocurrency crime, essentially. And we provide a B2B service. Um, it's an AML service for banks as well as um, cryptocurrency companies. It's a forensic service for law enforcement agencies. 
In uh, terms of my background, I've previously worked across investment banking and technology. Uh, before starting Merkle Science, I was actually working for Luno. So uh, Luno is a cryptocurrency exchange that's headquartered in London, and they're across uh, three different continents, Africa, Southeast Asia, as well as Europe. So, uh, in fact, just yesterday they announced that they got acquired by Digital Currency Group in New York, a large uh, financial conglomerate. So, uh, during my time at Luno especially, I got a very good um, insider glimpse of what, what happens in the cryptocurrency world. And as Douglas mentioned, uh, everybody observes that essentially cybercrime is very quickly moving to cryptocurrency cybercrime. So a lot of instances of cybercrime, such as ransomware, now happen exclusively, or at least 95% of them happen exclusively on cryptocurrencies. So uh, on account of that, I, I did, I mean, I felt it was, it's necessary now for the industry, like not just us, but also law enforcement, as well as uh, folks like LexisNexis to work together to combat crypto crime. So that's, that's how I got started on this. And... Of course, there have been, um, during the webinar, I'll, I'll touch on some of these, but because Luno was across three different continents, there were obviously very interesting observations across, like, say, Africa versus Southeast Asia and Europe in terms of the way cybercrime was conducted as well using cryptocurrencies. It, it's, yeah, an incredibly, so, it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting space, I think, because, you know, I, as you mentioned, obviously, to have your computer unlocked once you've hit the ransomware. And, and we, were, we were just talking just before the, the webinar about the time that I nearly uh, locked down my entire company's systems by clicking on a ransomware email. But really the only way for cyber criminals to get paid, or the only logical way for them to get paid, is through cryptocurrencies. Because of the pseudonymity, I always struggle with that word, because of the pseudonymity, because of the fact that not all of the regulatory environments are the same and there are gaps, there's the ability to take advantage of that and to get paid in cryptocurrency and be out of cryptocurrency into, uh, into cash or, or, or elsewhere uh, before, uh, before anybody cottons onto it. But I guess before we get to that next step of, of how they launder money, of how they use the money, of how they get the money out of the crypto system, it would be good to start to, to get your view on the actual crimes themselves and, and how, they, how the crimes operate, how the criminals operate. Right. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, essentially, uh, the most common, um, I, I think the most high-profile cases that you read about are exchange hacks. So cryptocurrency exchanges get hacked. And uh, typically, there is an internal vulnerability, um, either an employee's details get compromised and they, uh, criminals, cyber criminals use that to steal funds from the exchange. So um, I think the most recent one is a hack um, of an exchange of a European exchange called Eterbase, where I think $5 million worth of cryptocurrencies was stolen from the exchange. Uh, a larger one I remember was sometime last year where uh, Binance also got hacked and they announced that publicly. Uh, typically, larger exchanges tend to have insurance so they can give your money back even if they get hacked. And uh, so that's a common occurrence we see. Apart from that, of course, all the others, some that you might have actually come across as well are um, essentially ransomware emails. And during COVID as well, there's a lot of COVID-specific ransomware or COVID-specific scams where um, somebody would email you saying that they're collecting funds for charity or collecting funds for COVID relief. You need to send funds to a Bitcoin address, but essentially it's just going into the criminal's bank account. So those are illicit scams, illicit fundraising, uh, ransomware or other major uh, sources. And darknet marketplaces, ICOs, and exit scams. So, so darknet marketplaces are essentially um, like there's something called the Tor browser, where it's difficult to trace people who use the browser. So, uh, a lot of people sell illegal substances on those darknet marketplaces. So, payment for that is typically made in cryptocurrencies as well. So, I think these would be some of the like 
larger um, or broader ways in which criminals get funds via cryptocurrencies. And uh, but but yeah, as the industry evolves, we'll I'm sure we'll see plenty of new uh, ways and new cases as well. So every month, we hear of something new and innovative in the crypto cyber crime space as such. Well, what we've seen in, in discussing with with your team, we've seen some you know innovative sort of next step cyber crimes from you know started with ransomware and then moved on to things like hacking into a computer and taking over a camera, which now we all obviously have the, uh, the physical blocker over the camera, recording videos of, of people and, and then sending them, you know, essentially sending them emails saying, if, if you don't pay me, I'm going to release this video of you as well. Is, is, uh, do you see a lot of these type of extortion, sextortion scams often, or is, is this something that is starting to be sort of, is this going away essentially? Uh, well, it's, it's not going away anytime soon. So sextortion is one of the most common types of scams that we see. So um, the criminal claims they've recorded you, um, I mean, essentially they put in something embarrassing. We've recorded you watching pornography, and uh, if you don't pay us the ransom, then we're, we're essentially going to release it online. And um, most people even now wouldn't bother because the amount is something lesser than $1,000. So a lot of people we've seen don't bother even now, and they, they literally just transfer that money without checking if they actually if the criminals actually have a video or not. So um, that's very common, and I think um, uh, it's even moving to maybe physical and real-world aspects. So we've even seen a kidnapping case where the ransom... So the kidnapping case was actually uh, a Malaysian client, so they heard about us through referrals, but the ransom for the kidnapping was asked through cryptocurrencies. So, so it's wow. uh, pretty much pervading all aspects. Um, it's, it's really interesting what you say about maybe they actually have information about you. Maybe they actually have a video of you. Maybe they don't. Um, there used to be, I, I don't know if it still happens, but they used to, in Mexico, they would see someone famous going into a movie theater, going into a theater where they knew they would turn off their phone and be sort of in there for two hours. And a ransom, a ransom demand would be made to their family saying, we will release them, pay us in the next two hours, or, you know, we, we will we'll murder them, essentially. And, you know, not being able to reach them, them being in the theater, not even knowing what's happened. And it's smaller amounts. A couple thousand dollars for a celebrity is nothing, right? And so it, yeah. it sounds like it's, it's essentially real-world crimes being adapted to the crypto, to the cyberspace. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, going ahead, this will become an even bigger problem, as I think more and more privacy protocols are built into cryptocurrencies. And uh, definitely something to note right now as well. Yeah. Well, when we talk about it, and we'll get to it in a little bit, but we do talk about how, you know, something like Bitcoin, which is obviously the largest and most liquid cryptocurrency, is pseudonymous but it's not anonymous. So it can be traced, it can be tracked, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. So it's worrisome if it's becoming even more anonymous and if those coins gain liquidity. As we talk about that and as we talk about the crimes, obviously the back end of, of any financial crime is the laundering. And, and we talk about laundering a lot in banking, we talk about it in finance, um, and we talk about all the structuring and layering. What are the ways in which criminals launder the cryptocurrencies once they have them, either through a hack or through ransomware, through sextortion? Um, what, what do they do with it? Right. So um, I think before we get into the laundering, so while, while Bitcoin is pseudonymous, uh, everything that happens on the blockchain can actually be visible. And uh, companies yeah. such as ourselves actually de-anonymize entities on the blockchain. So it's, it's not as safe for criminals to use cryptocurrencies as they think it is. It's just a misconception that they have. They cannot be tracked. And um, one thing I've seen is the laundering piece is still the toughest piece. Like you may obtain those cryptocurrencies, but then everybody knows where it's, it's going and they're tracking your movements. And 
you you'd have a lot of trouble when you try and convert that cryptocurrency to maybe money in your bank like US dollars or Singapore dollars um so um and we've actually seen this evolve so in the earlier days pure play cryptocurrency exchanges were used like um but as they got more and more regulated they started accepting crypt- like KYC details then criminals moved to more uh, the f- crypto to crypto international sort of cryptocurrency exchanges but then i think yeah. even that segment is now getting heavily regulated so we're 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 seeing people move more to um, decentralized exchanges as um, coin mixers has always been popular but like the problem with decentralized exchanges and coin mixers is that they're not as easy to use so while sophisticated criminals obviously like they use code to distribute their funds and launder them through multiple uh, decentralized exchanges or coin mixers there would be criminals that aren't as tech savvy and so um, they find those still like tougher to use so they try and use bitcoin atms they uh, uh, we've seen payment processors gain like cryptocurrency payment processors gain a lot of traction now because a lot of them don't do kyc so funds end up getting liquidated there as well and then i think so, everything else mentioned on the slides prepaid cards gambling as well yeah so so if i can ask because we we may have some attendees who are not as sophisticated in in the space as well can you explain a bit about how coin mixers and decentralized exchanges work right uh, absolutely so um, essentially i think without getting into the technical details it's um, coin mixers pool funds so say douglas and i send funds into a coin mixer then the way the funds are sent out it's difficult for anybody analyzing the public blockchain to try and figure out which funds belong to douglas or which funds belong to mrigang because they sort of taken funds from 100 different people and mix them in one place and then send it out again so it's tougher to investigate and decentralized exchanges function essentially like cryptocurrency exchanges but there's a smart contract there's something called a smart contract which is uh, essentially a piece of code so nobody controls a decentralized exchange it operates in a way like a peer to peer exchange so if i want to sell my bitcoin to douglas there's a smart contract that operates it and i essentially send uh, i send my ethereum to the, uh, to the smart contract and then that smart contract makes sure that it's sold to douglas so now what what happens because of these coin mixers and decentralized exchanges is that the traceability of these funds gets affected because you can't find out where funds went to after it's gone to one of these sources so that's yeah. that's why they've become so popular of late but the problem is that they're a they're not as easy to use and b there's not as much liquidity as there is on the larger exchanges so if you're laundering uh 10 million dollars worth of funds it it wouldn't work out very well if i mean um if you were using coin mixers because it a, a large number of the funds a coin mixer might have liquidity of only like a uh, 2 million dollars but you're laundering 10 million dollars so anybody can determine that a majority of funds going out are going out to you yeah it, it's it's an interesting concept and i think the reason why bitcoin ethereum are still really the 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 cryptocurrencies that people are using is because to launder large amounts you need a lot of liquidity and using smaller coins that nobody's nobody nobody uses it makes it very difficult to launder launder without liquidity it's very clear who's getting paid where um in in terms of the prepaid cards and the and the gambling platforms you mentioned that as well is, is that something where you can prepay a, a credit card with uh with a cryptocurrency and then use it as you would a normal a normal credit card uh yeah i i mean it's uh it, that is something that a lot of criminals use but that's not a way that is one of the most easily traced uh, avenues of uh, money laundering where you essentially prepay a card and the, with cryptocurrencies and uh, use that at various avenues so it's um i think this like because there's a real world kind of connect it, it literally tracks uh, helps helps us track you to your physical uh, self as well your location your physical self 
But we've seen criminals do that who are desperate to liquidate their cryptocurrencies or aren't aware that they can be tracked this way. Okay. And, uh, with and, gambling and, as well, you use yeah. that money essentially on the gambling platform that, and you utilize it and then like essentially you get paid out. So there's a mixing element there. That's, that's interesting. And, and for the gaming gambling websites, uh, uh, do they do they know that these? I assume they don't know that these funds are coming from criminal sources. Are they are they completing KYC on these sources of crypto when they come in? How how does that operate? So um, a lot of these platforms have now um, started doing two things. One is a KYC, so that deter it deters criminals, and mm -hmm. the second one is more around even the Bitcoin that they're receiving they would typically use a blockchain monitoring software such as us to make sure that those cryptocurrencies do not come from illicit sources. So um, once they start doing that, then uh, that's where it gets detected more or less. Um, or they make sure that these criminals don't end up using their platform to liquidate funds. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. Now, so we've talked a bit about the, the crimes. We've talked a bit about how criminals are trying to launder the funds. Let's talk a bit about the government and, and private sector and something you guys are, are very involved in at, at Marvel Science, um, the, the tracking of the criminals and the tracking of the criminal cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Absolutely. So... so. So we have, we have here, you, you've given us sort of an analysis of, of after the, the recent Twitter hack where uh, Barack, I believe Barack Obama and uh, several other celebrities uh, tweeted out to send them cash and they would send you back double in crypto. Um, this, this is, I guess, sort of a, a, a spider map of the transfers of, of what happened essentially. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes. So uh, this is essentially a, a snapshot of the blockchain. And um, the, the addresses in red are the ones that were the hacker addresses. And then the ones on the right are essentially where the hackers sent funds to. And the ones on the left are where the funds came from, essentially the victims. So... Okay. Um, and, and so when you work with governments, because obviously uh, governments are very keen to stop this type of, of criminal activity. Um, at what stages has, has all of this happened by the time uh, the governments get involved, but by the time the crypto exchanges see what's, what's happening? Or at what stage do they stop, start trying to block transfers, start trying to block uh, different cryptocurrencies? Right. So um, I think both these um, different entities, like government agencies or law enforcement, they tend to investigate a crime after it's happened, because that's their mandate. Unless a crime has happened, they can't investigate it. And But cryptocurrency exchanges operate more like financial institutions. So mm -hmm. they use tools such as ours to um, predict before a crime will happen or like predict uh, criminal wallets that are, or addresses, blockchain addresses that are suspicious, and then take action before the crime happens, if not, right after the crime happens, retrospectively, so that they can report it to uh, local authorities. So maybe in this slide I can explain how law enforcement pretty much went through and analyzed the Twitter hack and caught the perpetrators. And I, I think the next slide kind of talks more about how exchanges typically take proactive measures in the space. Yeah, so, um, so if you, you uh, I think Douglas, there was just one thing I wanted to point out in the previous slide. So, sure. so, so just to give you a background of the Twitter hack. So the criminals were actually caught in two weeks. So they made two mistakes. One was that they, like this was a very high profile case. It, if you, want to steal funds, it, it's a lot better if you just um, e email a pervert that you know and tell him you've uh, video videoed him watching porn and then he pays you ransomware. 
But the worst thing to do is to um, like hack into the Twitter account of a former U.S. president or a celebrity and post a crime because that just brings enormous pressure on law enforcement across the world to track you down. So yeah. um, never do high-profile <laughs> crimes, essentially. No, and don't the, do so. <laughs> exactly. And the second mistake they did, I think these criminals were actually first-time criminals. And there's, there's a lot covered about it in the media. There'll potentially be a movie about it as well. So they, um, they weren't very careful in covering their tracks. Like if you, um, I'm not sure if you can see the screen very well, but a large number of the, the funds were um, associated with wallet addresses that had previously interacted with a large exchange such as Coinbase or uh, Luno in that case. And some of the funds were even sent to Binance for liquidation. So now um, I think government agencies use two things here. One is that they got in touch with all these exchanges. All these exchanges um, pride themselves on their regulatory relationships. So they make sure that they provide information to LEAs whenever necessary. So any KYC details, if there's no KYC details, then potentially IP details or uh, information about the criminals from their browser perspective, which can help track them down. So law enforcement got all this information from these other exchanges, and then eventually, I, I think everything you do online can be tracked down. So it, it was pinpointed directly to where the criminals' addresses and their location, and from there they got arrested. So I I think that this is a part of cybercrime that a lot of people don't understand, and that. Everything is recorded on your computer, even after you've deleted it, it's still there. You know, law enforcement can find it on your computer. Obviously, all of your interactions online are saved for at least a certain amount of time by not only crypto exchanges, but by any company that you're interacting with online, because at a minimum, they're using it to try to analyze you and understand how to sell to you more. But, and, uh, you know, they're also potentially keeping it for compliance purposes. And then, as you mentioned, on the, on the cryptocurrency side, it's not completely anonymous. It's pseudonymous. So, so companies like you, governments, can track where the coins have been, where the coins are going. And so, really, a, a lot of that anonymity that used to occur by transacting in cash disappears once you're online and once you're committing cyber crimes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's um, that's something very important to note that a lot of people forget. So you you mentioned uh, briefly the way that crypto exchanges are, are attacking this problem, and, and I want to talk to it a little bit at the end as well when we talk about technology and tools, uh, the way we're looking at it for the future. But if you can talk us through now sort of how cryptocurrency exchanges, how financial institutions are looking at this risk and managing this risk, uh, that would be great. Um, sure, absolutely. So, so essentially, in the early days, cryptocurrency exchanges had no idea about who was sending them cryptocurrency funds and uh, who was sending funds out from them either. So, and then very quickly, of course, everybody started doing KYC. But even then, there is a certain element, like you can use fake KYC documents so you don't know where your Bitcoin is coming from. So now what exchanges do is essentially use tools and build in-house processes to make sure that when they receive incoming uh, cryptocurrency deposits or outgoing cryptocurrency withdrawals, they check this against databases of addresses to, or databases of addresses to see if it's a criminal address. So in, um, in the case of the Twitter hack, so if any of our customers would have received funds from the Twitter hacker addresses, they would have received an intimation from us saying this particular transaction was involved with the Twitter hack or this particular transaction was sent by the Twitter hacker. So, so in that case, these cryptocurrency exchanges, they immediately freeze these funds and report it to the regulator. And now financial institutions have also started doing that. So as financial institutions either launch cryptocurrency products, they need to have this AML process in place. If they 
bank cryptocurrency companies. They need to make sure that their cryptocurrency companies that they bank follow these processes so they keep an eye on their cryptocurrency transactions. And um, mm -hmm. another interesting thing that started to happen is that banks, I mean, banks accept a lot of fiat transactions from multiple sources. So a lot of them are working on, um, like, with providers such as ours to track what percentage of these fiat transactions comes from cryptocurrency companies. So this is where it's kind of tying into the um, non-blockchain world as well. So you, so um, so all of this kind of um, become measures that not just exchanges, cryptocurrency exchanges, but also financial institutions uh, implement to try and uh, get an idea of their cryptocurrency risk exposure. And well, it's essential that the financial institutions are involved in this as well, not only because of the regulations, which we'll get to in a minute, but also because there's a pretty high likelihood that if someone is committing cyber crimes and cryptocurrency crimes, that they're also committing frauds in the real world as well, which could negatively affect those financial institutions, and they should have, um, you know, they should have processes in place to detect and, and to stop. So this really is just an extension, and I think what what I've found when discussing the space is that people are immediately baffled by the entire concept of, of cryptocurrencies, but in reality, it's just another asset delivered in a, a different way uh, with slightly different risks, but in a lot of ways, the assets are, are no different than any other type of, uh, of, of value store, and the exchanges are very similar to uh, financial institutions in, in the way that they operate um, you know, and they operate in, in the fiat world, if you will. And so dealing with them, it only makes sense, and we're going to talk about uh, recommendation 15 and 16 in a minute, but dealing with them in the same way that you deal with financial institutions and dealing with virtual assets in the same way you deal with assets in the fiat world just makes sense. Right, absolutely. So if we move into the regulatory space, um, can you talk a bit about what regulators are doing both in the region and sort of globally that will affect uh, people in the crypto space here in Asia Pacific? Right, so, um, so I think now most regulators in Asia Pacific have either a regulation in place to tackle this new segment of fintech companies, or they have AML guidelines. They've published guidelines on AML norms. So one thing to note is that irrespective of whether cryptocurrency companies are regulated or not regulated in your geography, uh, you are subject to um, standard AML CFT regulations within your country. We, uh, almost like literally every country has AML CFT regulations that mandate that a company or a financial institution cannot or should have measures in place to ensure that they're not being used for money laundering or terrorist financing. But uh, of course, some of the key, I mean, Singapore is like a very good example of how regulations uh, have come about. So the Payment Services Act was uh, ratified last year and essentially all cryptocurrency companies in Singapore now have to be licensed to operate and the regulator went as far as publishing a um, the ms published a 70 page document on just aml cft guidelines um, for digital payment token providers so i think that covers every aspect of compliance it's cryptocurrency as an industry is literally becoming financial services so yeah. the entire guideline was mimic like Re replicating what they pr previously published for banks or FIs, and it, it it took care of compliance processes, how important KYC is, and how your responsibilities don't stop by just getting vendors in place for multiple items. You need to have yeah. a compliance process, a compliance officer, uh, I think. So uh, a lot a lot of this was essentially covered and. Um, we're seeing this trend happening um, world over, not just Asia Pacific. So Europe's fifth AML directive categorically covered um, 
a section about cryptocurrency companies. The uh, FATF as well ke, um, ratified or has given clarifications about AML guidelines that apply to virtual asset service providers. So I, I think uh, now at least for cryptocurrency companies, the move fast and break things approach doesn't work anymore. It's all about trust and reputation. So compliance becomes um, a very important aspect, as well as regulatory relationships. Now that there's regulatory guidelines world over. So we we talk about a lot as when, when I was in banking about how regulation is a negative on business. It's a cost on business. Um, it, it's a societal positive in a lot of ways, but it's it's a, a business cost. A lot of people that I speak to in the in the crypto space, there's obviously a cost to being compliant, but in the net whole, it's a positive for the crypto industry because it brings it out of the darkness, it brings it out of the wild, wild west, and allows for more general adoption with uh, a blessing as such by regulators to operate. So it becomes, you know, it, it becomes a viable set of assets, a viable business, whereas historically, as you say, they were just trying to break things and you know, see what they could what they could do. Um, but the the regulation itself, the regulations themselves, have actually been a net positive for the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, like for example, uh, three or four years ago, most geographies in Asia Pacific or Southeast Asia uh, had a lot of ambiguity about the regulatory requirements for cryptocurrency companies. And that actually didn't work as well because most cryptocurrency companies didn't know what to do and there was no standard. So if you were a yeah. company that was following the best practices, uh, then liquidity would flow to other exchanges that didn't have stringent KYC norms. So I think most yeah. companies now are actually quite happy uh, about the fact that all of this has been standardized and Financial institutions are also a lot more comfortable dealing with this industry now. Uh, now that like regulations have come about uh, everywhere, or guidelines have come about from regulators. Yes, and, and headlining that is obviously the the interpretive notes on uh, recommendations 15 and 16. And essentially, what this did was codify essentially to treat virtual assets, cryptocurrencies, as assets as financial assets and to treat uh, virtual asset service providers and cryptocurrency exchanges and uh, is as the major part of that as essentially like financial institutions. And so I guess, you know, we, we have talked a lot on these webinars in the past about these two notes. I guess the, the question for you is, you know, do you see this being adopted? How do you see this being adopted? You know, it, it has it been general, well, it has to be accepted by the cryptocurrency exchanges, but, you know, are they fully, are they becoming fully compliant? Are they implementing these types of solutions? What, what are you seeing in this space? Right, um, absolutely. So, um, so I think just to give you a little background, I, I, I know you covered it on your other webinars, so, uh, the FATF in uh, 2019, they uh, mentioned that, like the FATF is a global body that publishes guidelines and they uh, essentially mentioned that virtual asset service providers would also need to adhere to uh, those guide the AML CFT guidelines that apply. So it's essentially recommendation 15 and 16. So based on our conversations with the cryptocurrency industry, uh, almost everybody is aware of the FATF guidelines and um, different jurisdictions have also started implementing those guidelines as per their reg into their regulations. So um, there's definitely a net positive that the industry sees coming out of it because uh, again, now regulators are more comfortable with it and because of that financial institutions and consumers are comfortable with it. And there is a standardization. While while it increases compliance costs, everybody has to do it. It's not like you increase your compliance costs and uh, other companies are avoiding this and get or getting away with it. So, and in the cryptocurrency industry, especially um, regulatory arbitrage was a big problem earlier. And with with the FATF guidelines, one major thing I see happening is 
the scope of regulatory arbitrage is decreasing over time because most countries across the world come under uh, the FATF and would need to implement these guidelines as part of their regulatory policy soon. Yeah, pe people have a ask a lot. They ask often, you know, every country has a different regulatory approach. How do we ensure some level of, of continuity or standardization? And I think that this is really it, right? These two interpretive notes from the FATF, you know, if, if you don't want to be on an FATF blacklist, you know, maybe it's not their top priority right now, but it's certainly growing in importance, and it has been for the past several years. And so it's going to become a part of the mutual evaluations, and you are going to be ranked on, on how you're delivering in the, in the virtual asset space. So, you know, countries, regula regulators, and then the companies within those countries are going to have to meet these FATF, FATF expectations. If if we turn to the expectation on financial institutions, the financial institutions that you're, you're speaking to, you know, you mentioned that they're starting to become more comfortable with dealing with VASPs. Have they started to implement their own sort of processes, their EDD processes on the exchanges? Um, yes. So um, the, a lot of banks, at least, um, now even have a cryptocurrency strategy at least in Europe, they, they, a lot of the smaller banks have entered the space where they're providing cryptocurrency custody solutions. The US OCC declared, um, essentially put out a note saying that banks in the US can uh, engage in cryptocurrency custody. So again, like the markets in the West, banks are already moving very quickly in this space. In Asia, I would say the pace of adoption is I mean, it has it is relatively slower, but uh, it's happening at a steady pace. As th there are clearer regulations now, they've all they've all started inquiring about the different processes they need to put in place. Um, they've uh, essentially allotted resources to put this process in place, and um, will do so in due time as well. So that's that's been our experience with financial institutions as such. Great. And, and just quickly touching on as well, uh, Rule 16, which is the update to the travel rule. And again, this makes sense when you just view uh, virtual assets no different than any other financial assets. Are, are cryptocurrency exchanges starting to implement, have they implemented the, the new standardized messaging uh, protocols? Are they collecting and reviewing this information? What, what's happening in that space? Sure. So um, uh, essentially, this this particular section of the travel rule is um, where originator and beneficiary information needs to be shared is uh, quite complicated. And even in traditional finance, it took quite a few years before it was implemented. And um, in the cryptocurrency industry, at least, it it's everybody is working towards it. There are still some questions around how uh, it's going to be done. Uh, and but probably in the next one to three years, everybody will have a travel rule solution in place. There are some inherent issues of the travel rule. So one is the sunrise problem. So if countries where it's mandatory to implement the travel rule or jurisdictions where exchanges operate, if they implement it before, say, a nation in Africa does it, then there is inconsistency and they're put at a clear disadvantage because of that. Then secondly, I mean, I think as soon as the travel rule was announced and, and that cryptocurrency companies need to implement the travel rule was announced by the FATF, uh, there were a plethora of technology providers that have come out who are all using different methods to facilitate this transfer of information. But it's it's still fairly complicated from a logistical perspective because there are AML implications of a repute, or uh, sorry, privacy implications of an exchange, say a reputed exchange in, in Europe sharing information with a lesser known exchange uh, or an upstart exchange in an, another part of the world. So the travel rule was still easier to implement for banks because banks are regulated entities, but Virtual asset service providers have different regulatory statuses all across the world. In, in certain jurisdictions, they're still not regulated. So that brings about a second layer of complexity. 
So we're seeing multiple providers come into the space that offer technology solutions. And there is complexity in that as well because um, how they would interoperate isn't very clear at this point. How would, multi say, Coinbase uses a, a solution such as NetKey, but um, maybe another exchange would use Notabene, which is another well-known provider. So how, how would they share information when they're using different providers? So I think bilateral relationships between exchanges would also become important going ahead, where exchanges would have a whitelist of other exchanges that they deal with, and they keep having, they have a team internally where they add more and more VASPs, uh, virtual asset service providers, to that whitelist of trusted parties they can share information with. Again, becoming sort of like the, the correspondent banking business, again, mirroring the way yeah. Business is done in you know fiat financial institutions. As we're coming close to uh, to the end of uh, at the end of our hour, we want to leave ten minutes for for questions. So please make sure if you have a question, you put it in. We we have several already, so uh, please keep uh, bringing them in. If we don't get a chance to answer your question, by the way, we will reply by uh, by email. Um, I, I want to turn the conversation to, you know, we, we get asked a lot of times post webinars, what are we doing to help, to help stop these crimes, to help track these crimes? And so I wanted to talk a bit about uh, technology that we're using in, in conjunction working with uh, Merkle Science, and it's actually how we were originally connected. Um, we met uh, for the first time at uh, Singapore FinTech Fest last year. Using our threat metrics technology, which collects data on uh, from from our, our customers are your banks, e-commerce companies, cryptocurrency exchanges, collecting data from them. And you can see the types of data here. We create something called digital identities, which is the identities of individuals, but when they're online. So you have physical information like name, gender, birth date, that you're screening all the time. We're collecting this type of information to be able to screen them for fraud and money laundering in the digital space. And so a lot of that work is being done right now in financial institutions. Again, e-commerce e companies, when you, when you sign up for a, a travel company, try to get a, a bonus with a, an online television provider, uh, they're checking to make sure that these are not fraudulent transactions all the time. But the way that we're looking to adapt this for the crypto space is to try and innovate and understand the way that criminals operate. And so if you look at this is the, the typical digital identity graph, you see a, an individual could have 10, 20, 30, potentially hundreds or thousands of you know, public wallets. And so when an exchange finds somebody who's potentially criminal, when Merkle Science finds a wallet that is criminal and, and relates it to the exchange, they block that particular wallet. And if you find another one, you block another wallet, you block another wallet, you're, you're blocking them one by one. And it's the way that the industry operates now. The way that we're starting to look at this and starting to look at operating is by taking that information that is created by Merkle Science we find that one wallet and we block the entire digital identity so that along with it, every single wallet that they have becomes blocked. And you can make sure that if that digital identity as a crypto exchange, if they try to open up a new public wallet, if they try to connect to your website using fraudulent information, we can still connect them back to that digital ID and so we can block them there. So if they open up a new wallet, that one is automatically blocked. They open up another new wallet, that one is also automatically blocked. And this is currently in process. This is, this is something that we are, are, uh, are building. And, and we're really excited about it because it, it allows us, as Rigonk was saying before, it allows us to stop crime before it happens, rather than as the police obviously have to, can't stop a crime until after it happens or after they're aware of it. We're trying to get in 
ahead of the game with partners like Merkle, with the cryptocurrency exchanges. This is actually something I would love more broadly to talk to people in the crypto space about. So if you are in a cryptocurrency exchange, if you think this is interesting, please reach out to us, please reach out to me, and we can have a conversation about this and, and the way to move it forward and maybe a way to, to do it even better. So just to finish before we take some questions, as I see they, they are starting to pour in, so we should leave some time. Final key takeaways. Your, 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 your key takeaways, your final thoughts, Rigonk, uh, on, on, uh, on, on the numerous subjects that we've uh, covered today. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, one of the key things was that there is definitely increasing criminal activity via cryptocurrencies. And um, as both because of this as well as multiple AML CFT requirements globally, um, it, it is recommended that if you're a cryptocurrency company or a financial institution, you need to have an uh, AML CFT policy in place for, the, for your cryptocurrency division as such. And of course, we did speak about the FATF recommendations 15 and 16. Uh, while uh, while it's there are definitely a lot of complexities around how it's going to be implemented, it's definitely a net positive for the industry. And of course, to conclude, I completely agree with you, Doug. So there are there are a lot of limitations to just blocking addresses, and we. I mean, actively believe that essentially you should be doing what you mentioned, where you combine digital identity with multiple other data points and try and actually block out criminals rather than blocking out just wallet addresses. So doing both is actually a far more superior system, and um, we think that it's inevitable. So currently, the larger exchanges already do this in-house, but... If you are a growing exchange, essentially, it's inevitable that you try and have a strategy to implement this going ahead as well. Yeah, and to do it across exchanges as well is, is going to be the key win, I think. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And, and, I, and I think, uh, Mary, if we can pass back to you for some Q&A. You bet. Just a moment to... Just to moment to tell everybody if you'd like to ask a question just type it into the Q&A box hit the submit button and we'll get to as many as we can especially if you guys keep your answers short so we'll take a look right now first one uh, we'll, we'll make this for you Doug do we have a comprehensive list of virtual asset service providers or VASPS's or is there any publication on the VASPS's so I'm actually going to ask you, Mrigank, uh, your, uh, your views on this. There's no comprehensive list of VASPs that I'm aware of. I, I don't believe, um, unlike uh, banks, I, I don't believe that they're, uh, they are, uh, regulators are releasing lists yet. However, um, I, I would ask you if, if I'm completely wrong and maybe there's something out there I, I don't know about. So uh, there's no complete comprehensive list, but there's an agent, there's a, a firm in Gibraltar that's working, like they're essentially ex-regulators and ex-lawyers who are working on compiling a list of WASPs that are regulated and WASPs that are acknowledged in different jurisdictions. So um, I, 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 we're also working closely with them um, so there, this is currently in progress and should be ready by 2021, hopefully, post-COVID. I would assume that it's, it's quite difficult, given the number of regulatory environments and, and unregulated environments at this point, uh, and just the sheer size of the potential market, that it's, it's, it's quite a piece of work. Yeah, absolutely. So the, there are certain... Um, I mean, it, it isn't as straightforward, but at the same time, if you leverage your connections with regulators, you uh, that's what these uh, X-Reg consulting is what they're called. I forgot what their solution was called, but that's what they're trying to do, essentially, put together a list of WASPs. The, um, but currently, a lot of financial institutions also build this out in-house for their jurisdiction. Thank you, Ravi, for oh, the question. Yeah. And Rick Gunk, this one is for you. How can we possibly conduct KYC for potential clients whose SOF are cryptocurrency proceeds? So source of funds, I'm sure, is SOF. 
How do we know that these are legitimate proceeds? This is one for you from right. Rachel. Uh, uh, so I think that's a very good question, Rachel. So essentially, what uh, what you would do is ask the client to declare the source of their cryptocurrency uh, proceeds. So you would ask them when they acquired these cryptocurrencies, how if they made profit on them, how did they end up uh, doing that, which exchanges they potentially used for this. And then what you do is you either do it in-house or get a company like Merkle Science to provide something called a, a dig, dis, blockchain report where we look at uh, this data and essentially look at blockchain data, the historical cryptocurrency transaction, the source of funds, and uh, I, like make sure that both add up. Like If they're saying that they've bought and sold on Binance and they did this five years ago, then um, it, there would always be a trace of it on the blockchain. So that's how we can uh, correlate uh, these. And you also ask the other blockchain addresses involved in the process so that you can do a due diligence on all of these. This, this is something as we were discussing, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary, I was just gonna say that this is something that, um, we, as we were discussing earlier, where it's actually really helpful that it's, it's on the blockchain, even if it is pseudonymous, because you can do, in, in the same way you would do enhanced due diligence on a customer when, if you're uncomfortable with the source of funds they've given you for real world or, or fiat uh, source of funds, uh, you can do very clear uh, asset tracing essentially for uh, cryptocurrencies because of the blockchain and because everything is stored there. So you can see you know, were these used in criminal enterprises in the past? And if so, how far back? Is it a risk that they're connected to this person? And so it's much better than, say, someone showing up at your door with, uh, you know, with a, a, a suitcase of cash. I mean, obviously, not many, not many banks will accept that these days. Or, you know, even if you were to get a wire from a, a less reputable organization, this is even better than that. And you can do an enhanced due diligence, which is what you would do, again, with fiat currency. Sorry, sorry Mary. Oh, it's okay. Here's a question for you from Samuel. From a risk perspective, shouldn't we be more interested in blacklist rather than whitelist? For you, um, <laughs> in terms of, well, it depends on how you use a, a blacklist or a whitelist. It's, it's a sorry, it's a very broad question, so I'm not sure what angle you're coming from, and, and happy to uh, speak afterwards uh, to, to discuss. Uh, to discuss exactly the question, but I guess in terms of monitoring uh, monitoring cryptocurrencies or doing KYC, then yes, blacklists are helpful, especially third-party blacklists of the wallet addresses themselves, because then you would know exactly who the criminals are, and you could you could just block block them from transacting. In terms of whitelists, um, obviously each uh, each address for each wallet is unique. So you're right, a, a whitelist would be less necessary for wallets. If, if they're not on a blacklist, then you should be comfortable dealing with them. But if you're talking about individuals, then it's the same as any KYC where you would want to whitelist or accept uh, those individuals themselves once you're comfortable that they're not, you know, potentially, a, you know, when you're comfortable they're, they're a false positive and they're not real risk. Uh, Mary, do we have time for one more? Yeah, we're going to ask uh, Raganka if that's okay. Um, he says, uh, this is a question from Guan, if we already got ransomware, is there another remedy? So, um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's from a company perspective uh, or a consumer perspective. So uh, I'll probably try and answer from a company. If you run a blockchain company and you have ransomware funds, um, Essentially, as soon as you find out, you should report this to your local regulator or the police. And um, then, based on your compliance policies, so we've seen some folks freeze those funds as well, but that depends purely on your internal compliance policy. But even if you've received ransomware, like there is no way to stop somebody from transferring funds to you. But as long as you've um, previously done a KYC of that person or reported that 
to the local regulator uh, immediately, then um, uh, they can tell you how to proceed and you are relatively safer. So it's not like you've conducted a crime then. Thank you very much. Doug, anything you want to leave us with real quickly? Well, yes, listen, first of all, thank you again to Marie Gonk uh, for joining me today. This has been really interesting and I think a very good update on what is happening in the crypto space. Um, we are working very hard to try to stop these crimes, to work with banks, to work with crypto exchanges, to cut off the criminals and their source of funds and, uh, and the way that they operate. I would ask if you are from a crypto exchange out there um, and you are interested in what you've heard today to please reach out. Um, we are very interested in exploring these solutions further, and I am looking for people to speak to in the space to discuss it more in depth. So, again, thank you all very much for joining. Uh, thank you, Mary, for moderating, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much, Doug, and to you, yeah. McGronk, as well, for your presentation. Thanks to our audience as well for your participation and for helping us right now by filling out the short survey in front of you before you log out today. And by the way, if we didn't answer your question or you'd like a fuller answer, representative from LexisNexis Risk Solutions will be in touch shortly with the information you need. We will send you the webinar recording within the next few days. Once again, thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And yeah, I, I enjoyed the Q&A as well. It looks like the audience is quite engaged. So good questions there. And um, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Thank you.